Thanks for joining me today. Today I got with me a special guest, Jeffrey Rice. Excited to have you. Hey, man, how you doing? I'm doing well, man. How are you? Good. Jeffrey is the pastor of Covenant Reformed Baptist Church. Um, check out his podcast, Grace Covenant Podcast, with him and Haps Addison. And he's also the owner of Post Tenebrous Lux, the best Bibles that money can buy, the best around. You may know a man named James White, and I'm sure we can name drop for all day long about uh, who all is carrying around Post Tenebrous Lux Bibles. But if you get your hand on one, you probably won't ever touch another one like it. So uh, he's, he's the guy to go see. Jeffrey, thanks for being with me today. Um, today we're going to begin talking about uh, a little bit just about your background and upbringing. Um, have you always been a Baptist? That's the first question that I really want to ask you. Well, uh, as a child, my dad was a member of my uncle's church, which was a general Baptist. And so um, growing up, we went to a general Baptist church. Of course, I can remember going to a Nazarene church and stuff like that, just like at uh, vacation Bible schools and stuff like that. But I started reading the Bible, 9-11, so when the towers fell, that's the first time I picked up a Bible and started to read it. About three years later, I started going to church, and the, the church that was right across the street from me was a Southern Baptist. And I didn't know the difference between general Southern and, you know, how many different Baptists there were. Most people today but, still don't. Yeah, absolutely. But then I, uh, I just was, I asked myself, am I a Baptist because my daddy was a Baptist? And so I started going to a Presbyterian church and uh, and I was went to a Presbyterian church for, I don't know, three or four years. And then I started going to an Assemblies of God and I got involved with the, the, the Trinitarian Pentecostal Assemblies of God, Church of God. Well, I got ordained, went to a little Bible college there and got ordained as, as minister there. But then I was involved with planting a church. And so at this time I was preaching in the jail and I was also preaching. Uh, at this church plant. Well, they asked me to, to teach through the book of John. I said, well, I'm going to go verse by verse like I'm doing at the jail. I was just going through Genesis, kind of like just outlining the stories. I got to chapter three and realized, well, I didn't believe in the 16 fundamentals anymore, and, and I might be a heretic. <laughs> so that was the last time I, I, I preached there. I kind of set myself down and just, you know, again, what 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 do I believe? And so I was on this long, this long road, and this was probably about the time when, uh, when uh, uh, John MacArthur's ministry, Grace to You, came out with the Strange Fire Conference, and I was entered like, like watching St Dr. Steve Lawson behind the pulpit captivate me without running around, without you know, uh, walking around the room, just standing behind the pulpit with his hand gestures and just. I was so captivated by him. I, I never thought that I could be because I was used to people holding the Bible in their hand, walking around. And, you know, that's, that, that, that's how I was doing it and stuff right. like that. But I was, I was so enamored and I just was was eating everything up. And then, you know, from that conference, like it just kept linking me to other guys. And then I uh, found a, a 1689 Confession of Faith. And uh, and I was actually involved with plant, in a church plant with a 1644. Uh, 1644 but then I, I was I was reading them side by side I was like you know what I hope to 1689 so I got involved uh, became a member of a 1689 church and I think I was a member for six or seven years at a, at a church and then now I pastor a 1689 church in Tallahoma Tennessee yeah very well so at what point from going from the Pentecostal background to this more reformed background, at what point did eschatology come into play? Was it pretty quick or did it take a while? Oh, oh eschatology was in play before I was a Christian. Really? Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, because, you know, this whole dispensational premillennial thought, you don't have to be a Christian to know that this is what Christians believed. Right. Yeah. You know? and, uh, yeah. And so, um, Whenever I became a Christian, I bought into it without studying it. And so I was just, you know, I, I cut my teeth on John Hagee. I cut my teeth on uh, Perry Stone and, and all these guys. And I just hook, line, and sinker. You know, I was buying every book that they had and you know, just reading it. This book right here will tell you who the who the Antichrist is. Read the book. And they didn't tell me anything, you know. Right. And uh, just taking my money. Uh, but do you remember, it was 2017. They had the, uh, it was the uh, Revelation 12 sign was going to appear in the sky. The sun, yeah. sun, moon, and stars, yeah. right? And you had that, the, the, the stars. Yeah. yeah, you had all that stuff going on. 
Well, I bought into it. Well, I mean, I don't know if I bought into it, but I was like, man, this is could be something here, right? It could be, yeah, could be something here, right? I was already going to a reformed church, and I was telling people, I was like, look, listen, if you're too uh, reformed to pay attention, I don't know what to say about you. But, uh, uh, but after that, it really challenged me, and I thought to myself, man. Again, am I Baptist because my dad's a Baptist? I said, man, am I, do I believe this because I was always taught this? Have I really studied it? And I went through the book of Revelation, and I wrote down everything that I thought was weird, which was most of the book, right? <laughs> I just wrote kept writing it. stuff. Yeah, but but the connections that I, that, that I was making to it was was just phenomenal. And, and, and at the end of the day, I walked out saying, I'm not a dispensational. I'm not a pre mill. This has already happened. It's either already happened or Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And that's right. one of the things in, in, uh, that you're told in the premillennial dispensational system. Jerusalem will not be destroyed. Yeah. So that was kind of the hinge pin for you mm -hmm. in, in all of it. So you see, I'm assuming you see Jerusalem as the harlot then. Yes. The whore the Babylon. Babylon. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So you hold to a position that's called post-millennialism, yep. uh, which for some of our listeners who may not be familiar, could you give just a short version of they people may not even know that there's something else other than dispensational pre meal. There's an all millennial and a post millennial position as well that are orthodox. Can you give just a short overview of post meal and kind of how you see it? Well, sadly, all of the meals take their position from revelation chapter 20, which I think is, it's not a good thing, but, yeah. but since it is what it is then it is what it is. Right. Yeah. And so, and so I believe that the kingdom of God came with Christ and that that kingdom is on earth and that kingdom is growing and it will continue to grow. And the whole earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. And then when Jesus comes back to inaugurate the, um, the eternal state. So, so basically this is that the bride of Christ is the new heavens and the new earth that when Jerusalem was destroyed that was the old covenant system that was the whore babylon leaving the earth and then the new covenant the church the bride of christ the, that's the kingdom of god it's on earth and it's going to continue to grow and fill the earth until our lord and savior returns right so there is there's an eternal consummation let's make yes. sure we we establish that and yep. you're saying that so you've got old jerusalem and but in revelation 21 you picture new jerusalem as the new covenant church is that yes? Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so you would connect that the new to heavens, the new earth, the old covenant, new covenant system. Right. So you have the old one leaving, and the new one coming. Yeah, that's good. So Hebrews twelve, which talks about how we don't come to a mountain made by hands anymore, but we've come to the heavenly Jerusalem. That would yeah. be that would be yeah. a connection there. But absolutely. Yeah, and I think it's important for a lot of folks also because when I was having a conversation, as soon as you tell someone that, look, Revelation twenty one we think is talking about the the church or you know this new covenant structure they people start to look at you really sideways um and and understandably so i mean the first Absolutely. time you, you heard it i mean that's yeah. what we were thinking because, i was like oh, first time i heard it, i said i don't believe that crap right <laughs> <laughs> seriously yeah. that's what that's um, what i said <laughs> i mean that's just that's just the thought of it but you begin to study it out and you start to see scripture and in a different light and when you take scripture interpreting scripture i think it changes our hermeneutics in such a yeah. drastic way and speak to that just for a second if you don't mind how much is this more of a hermeneutic thing than just hey we want to believe this position but no the way we read the bible has changed it, yeah. is that fair for you yeah absolutely so i would say for me when it comes to hermeneutics it's covenant theology so so so, so, so everything derives and drives from covenant theology and so um and because i read the bible I, I don't want people to say well you don't take the bible literal because right. i absolutely do as a matter of yeah. fact i think i take it more literal than any dispensational right. or any uh, historical pre-mail uh, and i would I'd gladly open the scriptures and walk through it but i take it literal according to the genre Okay. Right. And so yeah, sure. uh, when it talks about sun, moon, and stars, this deconstruction language, mm -hmm. I go to the Old Testament where it talks about sun, moon, and stars, the deconstruction yeah. language. And what it says it means is what it means. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so when it talks about the sun, moon, and stars, or the, the sun is going to darken, the, the moon will not give us light, and the stars will fall. Well, 
you know, I'm not thinking that our literal sun is going to dark, uh, turn to blood, and the moon is going to go dark, and stars are going to fall and hit the earth. If one star was to hit the earth, no right. life on planet earth because yeah, the stars sure. are bigger than earth. Like, okay. <laughs> Let's flesh this out just for a second. So in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, and I think it's 29, it says, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will fall, star, sun, moon, stars, your whole blood moon thing. Let's go to Isaiah 13. And let's look. I'm assuming Isaiah 13 is what you had on your mind. Yeah, Isaiah it? 13, uh, uh, Joel chapter 2. Yeah. Uh, it kind of, it, it all speaks the same thing. Okay. Let's look at, I'm going to go to Isaiah 13 and I want to, I want our listeners to know exactly what you're talking about. So what, what he's talking about in the principle of interpreting scripture is when he comes to a new Testament passage, that's from the old Testament, he wants to take the context of the old Testament passage and how it's used. So Isaiah 13 is the proclamation against Babylon in verse nine. It says, behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. Well, we know that Babylon is no longer a world power. The sun, moon, and stars, Babylon's lights have gone out. But the sun, literally, moon, and stars are still in the sky. So you're saying... But I would, but, but I would say that this is not speaking of Babylon. Really? I would say that this is speaking of Babylon taking, uh, uh, coming in to destroy Jerusalem. OK, to make Jerusalem desolate that I believe that the sun, moon and stars is Israel. Okay. And I believe it because of, of uh, Joseph's dream. That's good. And, and Joseph and Genesis chapter 37. Let me yeah, find verse nine. Uh, yeah, verse nine. Uh, good memory. It says, uh, then Joseph dreamed another dream and he was and, and, and told his brothers and said, behold, I have had another dream. Behold, the sun, moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I, your mother, and your brothers indeed come and bow ourselves to the ground before you? He, uh, Jacob interpreted this dream as him being the sun. Rachel being the moon and his brothers being the stars. It's good. All right. And so when I see in, uh, in I, you know, Isaiah, Joel, they're all talking about a, a judgment that's coming upon the Jerusalem where their land will be desolate. And in Matthew 24, where it talks about it, the sun, moon and stars, are, he's, he's speaking about Jerusalem's going to be judged. Yep. Their lights are about to be knocked out. And notice the next verse in Matthew 24, it says, and then you'll see the sign of the son of man in heaven. If the, if the literal sun, moon, and stars do what that text says, you're not looking into the sky. That's right. It's it's over. Yeah. Life on planet Earth is over. That's a good connection. I've never seen anyone. I've never heard that take on Isaiah 13. I've never heard yeah, anyone. Uh, yeah, when you, when, when, good, when you, though. yeah, when you read it and, and go to Revelation chapter 12, you have a, yeah. a woman standing on the sun. She's clothed in the, mm -hmm. the she's standing on the sun, clothed in the moon, and she's got a crown of Garland. 12 stars on her head. She's standing on Jacob. She's clothed with Rachel. Yeah. She got the 12, she's got the, the tribes of Israel on her head, and she's pregnant with a male child who will rule the, the nations with a, with a rod of iron. This is speaking about Genesis chapter three, verse 15, the yeah. seed, offspring of the woman. This is speaking about the, 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 uh, the, the offspring of the woman is going to come from Israel. Yeah, that's a super good take. So, yeah, that helps to, that helps to, to clear things whenever we think about reading the New Testament in light of the Old Testament. And really, how much of this and how much has this impacted you? When I used to read the Bible, I would think, man, I've got an Old Testament, a New Testament. I've got two different stories. How much more now do you see the Bible as one story and correlation? I fell in love with the Old Testament. Yeah. Listen, I used to dread reading the Old Testament. Yeah. All right. What does this have to do with me? Right. Right. Are, are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. I mean, just, just to be honest, can, can we be honest? I, 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 I dreaded it. Now, man, I so love it. I love it. I mean, in my Bible reading plan, I, I read six chapters a day. Two of them are New Testament. All right. I read yeah. more Old Testament now. Yeah. I love it. That makes it, it makes so much sense. All right. So let's talk about your net. You're necessitating um, 
optimism with this post-millennial position. So if you're going to do that, what does that do to the Great Tribulation? What does that do to the last days? Are you telling me that we're not in the last days? Because obviously you can look around and the world's getting worse and worse, isn't it? Well, if you want to uh, see, personally, I wouldn't look at the world and say it's getting worse and worse. All right. I, I believe we're in a in a bad place in this world because of the church. I look at the church. I don't. Heathens are going to be heathens. Hallelujah. Holla back. Heathens I mean, they're going to do what they do. Yeah. Heathens are going to heathen, right? All right. But but Christians need to love. Jesus said that you would know my people by their love for one another. That's good. He, he didn't tell us to wear yarmulkes. He didn't tell us to wear turbans or burkas. He told us to love one another. All right. So I look at the state of the church and I can tell you that we're in a bad place. But I also look in the state of the church and see the growth that it's continually to grow and yeah. know that the post-millennial hope is true. Yeah. Now, a so, lot of post-mills will say that they believe that the world will be Christianized. I don't believe that. The text doesn't say that. Right. But it says that the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as right. the waters cover the sea. I, understand. So I believe that the knowledge, I believe that, you know, that, that Christians are going to go into all the earth, baptize, teach, and disciple. All right. The knowledge of God is going to be over the whole earth as the waters cover the sea. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't so it doesn't necessarily have to be something that's linear, that this thing just graduates to a utopia at some form. It yeah. can that we have America can go apostate and God's plan for e eternal optimism will be just fine. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Bible describes it as kind of like a leaven in a loaf. And whenever we get to Daniel chapter two, it'll talk about a a, a stone growing into a mountain. I like to tell people, you know, I, I like to give them an analogy that they understand. I, I, was, I was speaking to a friend uh, last week and, um, and, and they were asking me these same questions. And I said, well, let me ask you this. When you have a, a baby boy, does it come out a man? Like as soon as it comes out, is it a man got a beard, mustache? I mean, he's fully grown, tattoos and everything. I was like, no, don't be ridiculous. And I was like, so, so how does that happen? Well, he's got to grow. Well, it's the same thing with the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, it's we are. I believe we're still in our infancy as as the bride of Christ, and we're going to grow. As, as as we'll look in Daniel in a minute, uh, from a stone to a mountain that covers the whole earth, it it doesn't happen all at once. The kingdom of heaven is it, God does not have a a a a a a new Jerusalem in heaven that, that, that that's just going to fall out of the sky and land and crush all the enemies and and then and then we'll magically pass through the floor. All right, it's something that happens gradually. It it grows. The earth will become these things. Yeah, and that makes sense with Jesus' parables and what he said about the mustard seed and the kingdom mm -hmm. growing slowly and the leaven. So, if you're saying that it's gradually going to grow and continue, am I looking for the great tribulation in my future, or when are you saying the great tribulation happened? Well, I, I say the great the the one that the Bible speaks of. I say it took it started in 66 A.D. Okay. So this would have been when the Jewish revolt started, and then, um, and and then if you, know, I mean, if you wanted to go into it, you know, I, I can I can name the man of Perdition. I can tell you who the Antichrist and stuff like all that stuff is. But but I believe that it started at the Jewish revolt, AD sixty six, and it found its summation in seventy AD when the Jerusalem, the temple was destroyed, the land was left desolate. Okay, and you would use the Olivet Discourse in a large part to point yes. to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in Matthew twenty four, Luke Luke twenty one, and then in Mark thirteen, Jesus says that that tribulation is going to happen that generation. Can yes. you talk a little bit about what people do with generation and how they can take the Olivet Discourse and throw it in our future? For anyone listening that doesn't know, whatever you do with the Olivet Discourse is going to determine what you do with the Book of Revelation in part you can't separate them completely so there's a statement that says all of these things and i think it's in matthew 24 34 all of these things will come upon this generation you have to manipulate generation in a certain way can you talk about that some yeah so um let me pull it up here 
Yeah, so let's just look back for a second at verse 32. It says, uh, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as the branches become tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, so this will be from uh, ch chapter 24, verse 1 up to this point. Uh, when you see all these things, you know that some, uh, summer is near is at the very gate. Truly, truly, I say to you, this generation, the Greek word genia, the near demonstrative, uh, will not pass away until all these things take place. Again, right here, heaven and earth will pass away. So right here, heaven and earth, in my opinion, is speaking about Jerusalem. Heaven and earth will pass away. Jerusalem will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So uh, he said this generation. He didn't say that generation right. or, or our past generation. He specifically said this generation. And if you go back, it's, it's the Greek word. In the, if you go back to chapter 23, it says the same thing. He's speaking to the Pharisees in verse 36. Truly, truly, I say that all these things will come upon this generation. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city who kills the prophets and destroys those who were sent to her. How, all, how often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were unwilling. See, your house, the house of Ju Judah, the house of Israel, is left to you desolate. For I tell you that you will not see me again to everyone until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And if you go, if you want a definition of desolation, desolate, Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 18 gives you a definition. A desolation is when the land is empty. Yeah. And it's That's speaking good. about the land of J Jerusalem. That makes so much sense. And then in, in, in chapter 24, they walk out of the temple and they ask Jesus, when is this desolation? When are these things going to happen? And he mm -hmm. follows that order down. And that ta him talking to that generation makes so much more sense because he says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let let him who is on his housetop not go down and get anything out of his house. Let him Again, who is in the field not go back. He, he says, when you see this thing, second person plural. Yeah. Like he's, he, he didn't say when they, right. when them, he, he's speaking to his disciples and, and those who are gathered. Why do you think people read this? You know people read this why did we read it that way why did we in our bible reading plan when we got to matthew 24 and we read that did we just lay something over the top of the text and force it in it you know the, when when i first started reading the bible a friend of mine started reading it with me he stopped i continued all right and i asked him one day why did you stop he says because it doesn't mention me i was like what he said yeah it doesn't say my name in there it's not about me yeah Right. People want the book to be about them and not about Christ, not right. about his story. Yeah. They want it to be about them. And so I just think it's what people want to read themselves into the text. And if they know that there's something in our future, such as this for them to go through. Yeah. Oh, they eat that up like candy. Right. Yeah. Just browse, just browse YouTube and you can see all of the dispensationalists have 300,000 views per rapture video. I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. All right, let's get to, so you, you're you saying, based on Matthew 24, that the Great Tribulation happened in the first century, and you would use the time indicator of Revelation 1, where it says... Revelation said, 1, Revelation chapter 22, Behold, yeah. I'm coming to you soon. It's right. the, uh, the, the um, I think the Greek word is technos. It's kind of like you get the word technometer. Um, yeah. I'm coming. These so things when, will soon take place. So when you say that Christ came, okay, you're not saying second advent happened in the first century. What? Oh, no, no, no. What because kind of like, coming are you saying? Well, now, if you go and you look at Matthew. So, so, so let's not go there first. Let's go okay. to Matthew where, where, Matt, where Jesus is at the council and he's speaking uh, to the 20, Pharisee. 2664. You own it, son. Spent too much time on this topic. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want you to notice right here, it says, Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the cloud of heavens. 
That's the same way. That's the same way that it's used in chapter 24. The, the Jews knew that only Yahweh rode on the clouds of heaven. Okay. Jesus is professing himself to be God. And he, and, and, and whenever he would come like this, he would come in judgment, right? He is going to come as God in judgment upon this nation. And so okay. I believe that whenever they were destroyed, the same way that I would use a pencil to write a letter, the pencil in my hand to write a letter, God used Rome in his hand to destroy Jerusalem. Okay, so we can connect in in Matthew 24 when he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, let me connect this to what you said with Rome coming. Luke 21 in his version, in Luke 21, 20, he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. You would say that judgment coming of Rome to destroy Jerusalem was the coming that Christ was talking about. Yeah, but I would say that that's only the desolation. That's not the abomination. Okay. But, right. Okay. So, 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 so Rome came in because of the Jewish revolt. Right. Rome came in to, to uh, stop the revolt. But God sends Rome because of the abomination. Okay. The abomination, I believe, is them continuing to offer an animal sacrifice after Jesus Christ has already made the once and for all sacrifice. Okay. That They're makes still sense. offering at the altar when Jesus Christ has already made the sacrifice. That's the abomination. So God sends them for one purpose and they come for another purpose. Okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. But just so everybody knows and hear it again, he's not saying second advent happened in no, the first, no, no, first no. century. He's saying consistent with the old testament such as say isaiah 10 when assyria mm -hmm. comes to israel you've got a judgment coming of god god used assyria to come and judge israel then you've got rome coming now that's something similar yeah. to what he's talking yeah. about yeah yeah jesus christ in our future when he comes to inaugurate the kingdom his feet will touch the ground okay all right just make sure everybody settles that in all right let's get to daniel 2 um yeah, man. daniel 2 the book of daniel really had a huge impact on me, and I know you preached a, just a gem of a sermon on Daniel 2 not too long ago. Um, Daniel 2 is why I'm post mill. It's good. I think Daniel 7, 13, and 14, probably the reason that I am, that started me anyway. Talk a little bit about Daniel 2. Tell us a little bit about these kingdoms um, that have to do with Nebuchadnezzar's image and specifically. Let me grab something real quick. Okay. And specifically the stone. That's going to come. So he's going to go and he's going to get to Daniel chapter two. And really what he's going to see pictured is a dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. So when Nebuchadnezzar has the dream, um, he's going to need an interpreter. And then Daniel's going to come and he's going to interpret this dream for Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, I thought I was prepared, but I realized I left my sheet of paper over there. <laughs> As you see, it's just a picture of the statue. That's all I grabbed was a picture of the statue. Um uh, let me find the, the interpretation. I got a new Bible, so I'm trying to learn this layout. I'd change every week if I were you. Uh, I, just... <laughs> I, I, I do have a, a, a good opportunity to do so. My wife thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> All right, let's see. Do you offhand know the interpretation? Okay, here it is, the interpretation. It's got to be in the 30s. Yeah. He begins to explain the dream in 24, um, 36, as I think is what you're looking for. Yeah, okay. All right, so yeah, so uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, all right? And this dream, it, you know, it troubles him. And so he's looking for, he, he wants someone to interpret it, but not only to interpret it, but to tell him what he dreamed. All right, something impossible <laughs> no human being can do. Yeah. Daniel prays out of fear for him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going to die if they don't come up with this dream. Daniel prays to God. God gives them the interpretation. And so, you know, without having to read everything, Daniel makes known to Nebuchadnezzar that he is the head of gold. Right? So you have this image. You have the head of gold, chest of silver, the thighs of bronze, the, the legs of iron, and the feet of iron mingled with clay. Now, Notice he tells him that, that, that he says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of Go. But not only is he the head of Go, but Babylon is the head of Go. So that head of Go represents two things, okay. Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. It says so in the text. All right. Chest of silver, media Persia, uh, the thighs of bronze, Greece, 
the, the legs of iron is Rome. And then you come to the, what's called the iron mingled with clay. Now, right here at the feet of iron mingled with clay, this is where dispensational premillennial actually takes root. So they okay. see that as the iron and the clays mix, so they would separate. Notice I cut this statue off at the feet. So this is the gap that the, the feet have not taken place yet. Okay. And so the question has always been in my, on my mind, if we could figure out who the clay is, then we could figure out the timing of everything. Right. All right. And so just by diligent study, I believe that I figured out who the clay is and it was really simple. It's Jerusalem. Yeah. Uh, over and over, the scripture says, Isaiah, you pointing to God are the potter. We are the clay, Jerusalem. Yeah. Jeremiah, you are the potter. We are the clay. Romans chapter 9, speaking of the Jews, he calls them the clay and that he is the potter. So, oh, so, so you picture this as like the Herod, like the Herod dynasty who has part of the rule in that Roman culture, like as a vassal state? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And so, and so you have the, the iron the iron, which is Rome. Then you have, uh, at this time, was the Pax Romanus, the, the Roman peace. Rome was uh, in charge of 10 nations. All right. This is when the, when, when, whenever the, the, the feet of iron and clay were mixed. All right. And then it says that there was a, so, so, so it was kingdom. So you had the, the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of Medes and Persians, the kingdom of Greece, the kingdom of Rome, and the kingdom of iron mingled with clay, that they were together in, in, in a way. They mingled together, Rome and, and Jerusalem. Yeah, that's so they good. Had, they had something together. And then we're told that there's a, a stone that's carved out by no human hand. So I, so I see this stone that's carved out by no human hand, speaking of the incarnation. Jesus had no earthly father. This is taking us back to the offspring of the woman. It comes at the time of the iron mingled with clay, first century Jerusalem. So, so I, I would put Jesus' birth about 3 or 4 B.C. I'm with you. Okay? All right. He comes at the time of the iron mingled clay. He, that, that, that stone comes and smacks the statue on the feet. And that stone, which is Jesus and the kingdom of God, grows on the earth and covers the whole earth. I mean, that's the, so, so right here, verse 35, the iron, Rome, and the clay, Jerusalem, the silver, uh, no, hold on, I, mm, yeah, 34, and I looked and saw a stone cut out by no human hand, so this would have been the incarnation, it struck the image on the feet of iron, Rome, and clay, Jerusalem, first century Jerusalem, Judaism, it broke them into pieces, and the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold, all together were broken into pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. So, so this is what you would call an already not yet. Because some of these kingdoms were destroyed, and some of them were to be destroyed, such as Rome. Yeah. And so, and, and so if it, it, if you could like like say if you held up a a bungee or something like that, or like a trampoline. If someone was to stand in the middle of a trampoline, their pressure is drawing all those springs to it, right? Those yep. springs are, are feeling pressure of the one thing that's in the middle. The, the most central thing that's ever happened in human history is the cross of Christ. This is where Jesus bruises the head of the serpent while only bruising his heel. At that, at that one moment, this is the, the centerpiece that's going to crush all the nations. Yeah. And it's all being pushed to him. Everything that's that, 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 that that's happened previous that's already fell, it fell because he, 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 he died on the cross for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again on the third day. Everything that will fall, it will fall because he died on the cross, according to the scriptures, was buried and rose on the third day. Amen. How huge is that to see that the cl the climax, the centerpiece of human history is not in my future, but the centerpiece of human history is the cross of Jesus Christ and everything hangs on Christ. that. Everything, everything hangs upon that. Man, Romans, I mean, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 2 makes it very clear. You, you mind if I read this real quick? Go ahead. 
I'm, I'm gonna give some. Uh, I know you just preached through Hebrews. This is on yeah, your I'm mind. I'm still working on it. Uh, I, I I took a break. We're doing a little series on Reformed theology, just because of our our, our next section of Hebrews it deals with covenant theology. Uh, so Hebrews chapter two. This is probably the most important chapter, in my opinion, in the whole Bible when it comes to understanding eschatology. Really, Hebrews chapter two. First time I've ever heard anyone say that. It's good, man. You'll All see. Right. You'll okay. see. All right. So beginning in verse five. Listen, it says, for it was not to angels. I'm going to give some commentary as I go through. It was not to angels that God subjected the world to come. So the word world here is oikomene, and it's to come, that it's going to grow. But the word subject here is the Greek word hypotasso. It means to subdue, to take control of. That God did not send an angel to take control of the world that was to come, which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection, hypotasso, under his feet. Now I'm putting everything in subjection. To him, he left nothing outside of his control. Right here, at present, we do not see everything in hypotasso, subjection to him. We're still there. Yeah. We don't see everything in subjection to Christ. Yeah, that's but the so verse good. tells us it is in subjection to him. It's that, it's, that, it's that one point of history that everything's falling, it's leaning to, it's falling, it's going to one day be put under his feet. Right here it says that it is under his feet. First Corinthians says it's being put under his feet. It's both. Already not yet. Already not yet. It says, but we see him for a little while who was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. It gives us his name. This is speaking of his incarnation. Now watch this, crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, for in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of our salvation perfect, not morally perfect, through suffering, but, but this is him fulfilling the purpose that he was sent to the earth for, and that was to accomplish the purpose God has set out for him. This is speak, speaking of the uh, the covenant of redemption. God purposed to save a people. Jesus Christ comes to accomplish the purpose. The Holy Spirit applies the purpose. Go, uh, Jesus perfectly accomplishes the purpose through his suffering. All right? Um Verse 11, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he's not ashamed to be called to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of uh, I will tell your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me since right here. Therefore, the children share in flesh and blood. He himself likewise partook in the same things. Speaking of him becoming a man, him taking on flesh, that through death he might destroy, right here, the one who has the power of death that is the devil and deliver all things through fear of death who were subjected, hypotasso, to lifelong slavery. This is telling us that he came and he destroyed the devil through his suffering death. Now, we know that the devil is around. He's, he's roaring like a roaring lion. He's seeking whom he may devour. But this here tells us that he destroyed them. John chapter 12 says, now the ruler of this earth is judged. All right. It's a now, it's a now and not yet. Yeah. That's that good. statue is fallen. Yeah. John 12. All the kingdoms. John 12 or Revelation 12 there? John 12 says, now the ruler of this earth is judged. Speaking okay. of the devil. Very good. As he was going to the cross. That when yeah. Jesus Christ was crucified, that was when he bruised the head of the serpent mm -hmm. while only bruising his heel. That's when he was judged. So everything listen, that... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. So everything that we were held to, all, all of this, these accusations that were against us were, were still there. 
but through the work of Christ, what you're saying, the accuser has lost his place mm -hmm. in the heavenly places. Yeah, well, so uh, if, if you notice, it says that at the, he's called the prince in the power of the air, mm -hmm. but then he's cast down to the earth. Yeah. So when he was cast down to the earth, he's called the God of this world. Right. All right. So I believe that him being bound is him not being the God of this world. Okay. But he went back to his other position, being the prince of the power of the air, who is able to travel to and fro. Yeah. When he was the God of this world, he was, he, he, he basically was the creator of Rome. He gave Rome his power. This is what Revelation chapter 12, 13 and onward speaks about. Yep. Uh, whenever it introduces uh, Satan as the red dragon said he had seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems, and then the beast that comes up out of the sea had ten horns, seven heads, and ten diadems. The only thing different about the two are the diadems. Yeah, uh, His diadems is pointing to his control over Rome, and then Rome's diadem is speaking of the ten nations that it had control over. Rome is the city of seven hills. It had ten kings, and it had control of ten nations. Yeah. So you're what you're saying is you've got it. You've got this war between Christ and Satan that's played out through people, through I mean, through us, and mm -hmm. we do the bidding of Christ, and he's essentially won the war. And you're saying that we're in the mop up duty. It's already it's already done. But it's we're already happened. This thing out. The battle has already been won. The, uh, the death blow that was swung, uh, uh, Colossians tells you that as they were, look, Colossians chapter two, I just, I, I read this earlier on my, my other podcast. This is really good. Colossians chapter two, verse 14, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Well, how did he do that? This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Yeah. That as they were nailing Jesus to the cross, they were nailing the record of debt that stood against us. This chasm that had me and God separated was nailed to the cross. Amen. And listen, when Christ came down from the cross, that record of debt did not come down to the cross. Now listen yeah. to what it says. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities, putting them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And it was as if, I mean, I, I, I say this tongue in cheek, but it's like throwing a punch and hitting yourself in the mouth. <laughs> the very thing that they were doing to put Christ in open shame, the Bible says that they Christ put them in open shame. Yeah. Through that. I'm brought about their defeat. Yes. Yeah, that's good. And that's also connecting Colossians 2.14 and thinking about that handwriting of requirements that was against us. You got it. Mm -hmm. Paul's thinking the same thing in Romans 8.33 when he says, who can bring a charge against God's elect? And mm -hmm. it's so it's so pure. It, how does that change the way you do? I mean, how does that change the way you do evangelism? It, thinking in that mindset that Christ is king and instead of people making him Lord, that he already is Lord. And we pull back the curtain and tell him to repent and believe. Does it affect you and how you live practically? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> again, like when I was a dispensational, I mean, I was always planning ways, you know, I'm going to hide some Bibles here, some clothes over here, put a little money back over here. Or, you know, like I, I feel like I'm living in God's sovereignty. Yeah. You know, God is in control because, I mean, as you know, I do street preaching. Like I, I do stuff like that. I witness like, I stay pretty busy, but I, I know that it's not up to me to save people. That's right. I know it's not up to me to change the world. I know it's not up to, to, to me to make a, the, uh, a to, to, to put a man in office and everything is going to you know be better. I know the world is going to be better because my Lord and Savior took on flesh, lived the life I could not live, and died the death that I should die. That in his act of obedience, he kept the law and earned eternal life for me and all those who believe in him. And in his passive obedience, he took the punishment which I deserve and you deserve upon himself. That he was both the priest and the offering at the same time. He, the mediator and the offering. And, at, and, and because of what he done, living the life that we could not live and dying the death that we should die, he has hypotasoed taken the world in control. All of it's been put under his feet. I have been put under his feet. And I know that everyone I preach to will one day be put under his feet. And whether their knee bends daily and their tongue confesses daily that he is Lord as mine does, or it breaks and they from the scream and smoke of their torment, they will cry out, Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Preach it, brother. That's so good. Yeah, just thinking about my guys and my circles, it's it's directed, it's affected us so much that, I mean, we're attempting to try to start a, a private school here in Northeast Arkansas. Mm-hmm. So just, I mean, that's it. It just changes the way you think about everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just, uh, yeah, man, that's that's amazing. So you're saying that great tribulation happened in the first century. There are some of these things that people are placing in our future that are in the past and specifically the victory of Christ. And I think it boils down to one of the arguments, and we can close with this, that I think is the clearest argument, and Ah Mills would agree with us on this, uh, is the throne of David and and how clear that the throne of David prophecy is. In Second Samuel, and I believe it's in chapter 7 and verse 12, we're told that David, David's told, he said, look, you're not going to build my temple, but there's going to be one who's going to sit on the throne after you forever. Peter picks that up in the sermon at Pentecost. You care if we read that and you help us out a little bit with that? And then, so, I, I, I just preached two messages on that. Did you? Surely you didn't mention Psalm 110 in that when he gets to it. Well, uh, I, I didn't because I, I, I have planned for that in a future message. Because I'm going through covenant theology. I'm, this week I'll start the covenant of grace and I'm going to go back and tie everything in a bow. Yeah. Make it real pretty. <laughs> All right. I'm going to read Acts 2, beginning in verse 29, and you just fill in, stop me where you want to, okay? Hold on, let me get there. And I, I think this is one of the clearest, easiest thoughts that people ought to be getting. Man, if we're Bible students, stop just reading the first half of Acts, okay? Stop just reading the first half of Acts when the Holy Spirit comes and getting freaked out over the speaking in tongues. Read the back half of the book of Acts. Now, the pre believe that a future temple will be rebuilt. Jesus will be seated on a throne, on David's throne, in that temple. But yes. you're saying that he's already on David's throne. He's here on the throne you. right now at the right yeah. hand of the Father, making an intercessory prayer for those that draw near to him. And you're going to use Acts 2.29 to prove it, connecting absolutely. it to 2 Samuel 7. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. I'll let you read it, and then you just commentate on it as you want to go. All right. So it begins. 29, I think, is probably where you're going to want to start. Yeah, okay. On. Yeah. It says, Brother, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he would not abandon his he would not he would not abandon to Hades nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and that of we all are, uh, hold on, I lost my place. This Jesus that God raised up, and of that we are witness, we are witness. Therefore, exalt, exalt at the right hand of God, having received from, from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out, okay, well, yeah, and it's seeing and hearing. Yeah, so if you go back, Again, it's 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 it, you know, the promise is given to, to, uh, to the to it's actually given to the serpent. It's the serpent's curse right. that he was going to put an offspring, uh, that the that, that an offspring was going to come from the woman, and that this offspring would bruise his head while only bruising his heel. God comes and he chooses a pagan by the name of Abraham. Okay, just follow me here. All right. He does this because the offspring of Satan is on the earth and he's wanting them, you know, so, so God needs to have a separate nation, a kingdom where this, sa- this satanic offspring will not pollute. All right, All right. So he may, here comes the earthly kingdom and he does, and he establishes it in Abraham, this earthly kingdom, this Jewish nation. And then from Abraham, it gets passed through Isaac, and from Isaac to Jacob, and Jacob gives it to Judah, all right? And from Judah would be David, not Saul, but King David. Benjamin was a ravenous wolf. He right. was the anointed king. I mean, he was the appointed king at one time, but he was not the anointed king. David was the anointed king, and David was told that, uh, that, that from his seed would come one who would sit on his throne forever. And this is where Jesus comes. He's sitting on the throne of David right now. 
the throne of David is not, it is not on earth. Peter, not my interpretation, Peter tells us that the resurrection is proof that Jesus Christ is the descendant of David who sits upon the throne of God. And we know, you know this as well as I do, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, right? So where's David's throne? At the right hand of the, well, like we don't have to make this up. Right. Like we're, we're not making this up. Jesus is the, the Davidic throne is at the right hand of the Father. He has fulfilled the Davidic promise. Jesus comes. Uh, David is the, the, the okay. So this earthly kingdom needed a king, which is David. The kingdom of heaven needed a king, and that is Christ. Right. The, so, da the, the, so David's the earth, throne still in Jerusalem. It's just in a heavenly Jerusalem. Than the New Jerusalem coming down from heaven. Well, see, but I would say that that, that the church is the New Jerusalem, right? Coming, yeah, okay, still coming down yeah. out of heaven is the picture, though. Yes, yeah, it's the picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, 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 so Jesus is the uh, the bridegroom. We're the bride. He's the head. We're the body. Like, like we're, we're 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 so in, in interconnected with the uh, with who Christ is. We are his uh, the, the temple of God. God. Uh, in a tabernacle no more. I mean, God doesn't tabernacle in tents and temples, but he tabernacles in those who receive Christ by faith. That's right. All right. Uh, we gather together. We are the church. We are, uh, we're, you and I are not the church separate. We're the church together, but we are in the kingdom of God. We right. are his children and a kingdom needs a king. The earthly kingdom had David, the heavenly kingdom has Christ, both set on the throne, one for a period of time, one for all time. And he's on the earthly now. kingdom promised blessings, earthly blessings and earthly curses. The kingdom of heaven promises eternal blessings. Yeah. Amen. So, Amen. That's so good. I hope Man, that made sense. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. That's that's pure. I mean, Christ on the throne, seated now, reigning, ruling, and he ain't going anywhere. And it tells you what he's doing. The Hebrews, it tells you clearly. Like he, 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 he ever lives to make intercession. Where's he doing that at? At the right hand of the Father. What's right. he doing at the right hand of the Father? Sitting on the throne of David, ruling and reigning, putting all enemies under his feet. There's a guy in my church. He says, well, "What do people think? He's sitting on a lawn chair?" <laughs> like, no, he's on David's <laughs> throne. So. On the throne of David. Man, Jeffrey, I appreciate you spending some time with me. I'll give a shout out to you again on Post Tenebrous Lux, man. The finest Bibles around. Thank um, you, man. Throw. You can, you know, I ain't throwing anybody under the bus by name, but um, check him out. He's he's good. Where can they find you at? Yeah, so uh, on our um, our website, ptlbiblerebinding.com, ptlbiblerebinding.com. If you uh, if you want to check out our uh, sermons that I preach, you can go to um, uh, on, on Facebook, Covenant Reform Baptist Church on Facebook, and Covenant Reform Baptist Church on YouTube. And you could follow our services and the sermons that I'm preaching. Uh, so I'm going through a series on Hebrews. Uh, I got to Hebrews chapter six, verse thirteen. I'm taking a break and do, and, and and teaching Reformed theology because covenant theology is Reformed theology. And uh, beginning in verse thirteen of, of, of chapter six, we're going to be introduced to covenant theology. So I'm just laying a foundation. Yeah. And so if you want to keep up with what I'm doing, that's probably the best way to do it. Yeah, that's great. And then Grace Covenant Podcast, that's Grace on. Covenant they can check that out on your on your Facebook page as well. Facebook page, you know. uh, Facebook page. We have a, a Facebook page for it. We have a group to you, you can stay connected with, and then uh, we have a YouTube channel, uh, Grace Covenant Podcast. Yeah, that's great, man. Thanks so much again for being on with me. God bless you and the work you're doing. Play, pray His blessings on your on uh, Post Tenebrous Lux and on your church as well, brother. Thank you so yeah, much. Man, I appreciate you, know, you having me on, man. I really do. All right. Hopefully, I'll see you again. It might be G three before I see you again, but hey, that, uh, we'll check you okay. out down there. All right. All right. Take care.